Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is Debbie G of Spirituality Gone Wild. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Now, originally, we thought that Neil was going to be joining us, and he still might be. Not 100% sure what's going on there, so we figured we would just continue on as normal, although I'm not sure I can call today normal because we have an extraordinary day happening today. Andrew Cap is in the house. He's right here, the man who wrote the last Law of Attraction book you'll ever need, and never ever need to read, in fact. And I mean, we, we had Andrew on here, I guess it was a couple months ago, had a great time with that. Just had to have you back again, because among other things, uh, we got uh, uh, this event coming up in January that we're hoping that you're going to be a part of. So that's going to be cool. Um, but we, lately, we've got a theme going on. And Debbie, I'm not sure of, uh, how much we've been doing the theme on Fridays, but we've got a theme going on that I've been working about how um, all of us want to have abundant lifestyles, right? Many of us yeah. have challenges with various aspects of it. There, there are the three, the top three things that people get all, um, you know, have the most challenges with. Uh, they are health, uh, relationships and money. And we're focusing on the money side most recently. And particularly we're trying to encourage not only adjusting the vibration, but also taking the steps because yeah, it's possible. I mean, Dan McGinn has written a book about how you can actually just attract the money to you and it just kind of shows up, but it's also helpful when you take the steps because like I was telling um, Andrew before the show, Jonathan Winters once said, if your ship doesn't come in, swim out to meet it. And sometimes that's what you have to do. You have to take the steps to go meet it. So that's really what we're going to take a little time to talk about today. But Debbie G, how you doing? You're looking good. You got you got yourself in your your hot spot there. You're looking good. I thank you. I feel good. I feel great actually. It's been it's been awesome. I am uh interested in how many people are sick right now. I'm like tripping on that. I don't experience it in my life. So it's like, wow. So I want to send out some loving energy seriously to David Strickle. He's not well. And to some other people I know out there that are either in the hospital with COVID or they are at home with it. Jim Herndon, he's home with it. There's some other people we know who are, this is all around. So I'm just going to ask everybody as you're jumping on, can you just like take a second and just send some love and energy to these, to everybody out there that's, that's sick right now? We are in the holidays. We all know last year wasn't as fun as we would like to like it to have been, and and me, but the fact of the matter is, is that everything's what you make of it, right? So okay. if you are, yeah, so if you are that person at home and you're sick, this is your time to stay down, stay low, relax into yourself, but also remember the other people out there who are struggling, and and reach out to somebody today just because. But yeah, that's. That was literally what my morning has just been like wowed at that. And then some other great news besides that. But beyond that, I am totally excited because I was out in my car like a half hour ago. As I was telling you guys before the show, Andrew, I knew nothing about this show because I wasn't on Facebook today to look. Okay. (laughs) And Andrew's in my head and I'm thinking about Andrew because I'm like, oh, I know who I want to talk to is Andrew. And that's like. That is exactly what I said. And this is a show. We are talking about the law of attraction now. And How about that? There he is. I don't there even know what to say. So. In the flesh. <laughs> well, yeah, well, a, a virtual flesh. Yeah. Virtual flesh. <laughs> well, yeah, that works though, right? It's real. You know, people hear those examples. They hear stories over and over and over again. And, you know, it, sometimes it doesn't sink in, but it happens. It's like just it as does. you're thinking of it. And. It almost becomes that question like in the Matrix where the Oracle asks Neo if he would have, you know, crashed the the, the vase if, if she never mentioned it. It's like, you know, was I in your head first? Were you in my head first? Who knows? But things just happen, right? I love that you even said that, that thought. Were you in my head first or, or how does that work? And I, I honestly, I wonder if it's unison personally. Well, sure. Yeah. Everything's That's what connected. I think. We're all one. Absolutely. So it happens all. Th- it's like we're having a phone conversation. Everything's all just connected, right? It is. Andrew, what I got to say, I am honestly, it's so good to see you. And Thank for anybody who doesn't know, 
Thank you. For anyone out there who does not know who Andrew is, Andrew Crapp wrote a book. There's the book. The last law of attraction book you'll ever read. The book on law of attraction. And it's available right there on Amazon. You have to go get it. Um, you are an Amazon bet. You are a national. No, you're an international bookseller now. World. So like you're up there, dude. <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, it's, it's interesting because we focus on manifesting things and then things come, but sometimes the things that you're not even focusing on come. Meaning when, when I was writing the book, the, the vision was just impact. The vision wasn't a specific number. I mean, obviously I was going for number one bestseller in categories. I'll gladly take that. But the vision was very um, non-specific. Like right now, uh, well, when the year tops off, I think it'll, it'll, you know, be 85,000 copies in the can. And for me, it's like, all right, awesome. But it's, it's kind of surreal to keep seeing those numbers and keep hearing numbers like that because it was, that was never part of it. It was just impact. So I'm just super grateful that it's been as well received as it has been. And that, you know, people are just, you know, really leveraging the content for their own purposes and really getting something out of it. Wow. I, I'm completely loving that so very much. And I just clicked something on my computer. I, I absolutely love this because you put it out there. You didn't sit around. Anybody ever like think that they've got to, they just sit and look at it. It's not growing. Plant a garden. <laughs> anyone ever? Why is it grow? Yes. I don't know. Why isn't it growing? I mean, you know. What I, what I heard you say is that you continue to create, you continue to do things and you've been surprised at how that this is working from the, yeah, well, of energy. the, the numbers just are, are, there's something new and, but, but to kind of Walt's point about like, you know, wanting to talk about action today. I'm a, I'm a fan of Dan Kennedy. He's a big marketing guy and okay. the a huge lesson that I learned from him. This was after he had made it. You know, he was a multimillionaire, massive success. Even after that point, he had a point of doing at least one thing in service to his business every single day. No matter what, doesn't oh, matter how wow. rich, like how successful it could be returning yeah. an email, it could be returning a phone call. It could be, and he did one thing. And I took that lesson into with this with every single day since before the book was published, since at least six months before it was published, because I had to write it and I had to do a lot of things. Every single day, <laughs> I do something in service to the book. This right here is fun for me, but it's still me doing yeah. something in service to the book. Every email that I've answered today has been in service to the book. Even if I've been like, it's, it isn't something that has to be like work. It doesn't feel like work. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But whether it is or isn't yeah. is not actually the issue to me. The issue is every single day, something is done to put this book out there more for people. So um, 85,000 copies doesn't come from sitting on the couch. It does come from sitting on the couch, being inspired, and then acting on the inspiration. You know, it wasn't out of lackful action. It, it was out of inspired action. So, again, I'm I'm super psyched by the numbers. I'm, I'm like, really excited about 100,000 because, it just, you know, uh, people put so much significance on ones and zeros. Um, I'll, I'm looking forward to having, like, a little announcement about that and doing that. But, but overall, every single day is a win, and I'm not going to complain one bit. I love this, Absolutely. but did you see what – Okay, but you got how you pointed it out. You pointed out action, and you use two different words for that. So say it again. Can somebody that's watching and typing type this in the chat? You said. Said well, I basically made a difference between lackful action and inspired. Lackful action, lackful action, and inspired action. That lackful action. So let's talk about that. What's lackful action? Yeah, well, I mean, for me, lackful actions where you're basically fighting yourself, not realizing you're fighting yourself. It's where you're trying to force the universe or force life to give you your result and not realizing that through the gritting of your teeth, through the frustration, the pain, the uncertainty, the doubt, and the trying to reach for something, you're, you're putting out this energy of not having it, which is why it's being mirrored yeah. back to you. You are inadvertently screaming to the universe that you don't have it. So the universe is like, all right, there you go. And you wouldn't obviously you wouldn't do that if you realized what you were doing, but there's such a level of impatience and frustration because people naturally can't blame them. They want to be happy. They want to be content and they want to have what they want. If something's taken a lot of years or a lot of time and there's been an investment in time and energy and focus and love and blood and sweat and tears, well, then of course, a lot of people are going to be inadvertently predisposed toward focusing on the fact that they don't have it 
thinking that they are engaged in a process of actually inviting it and they're not inviting it and they don't realize it. Well, I'm just going to say that you're speaking to me directly and only everybody else watching. He was only talking to me. This is it. (laughs) Um, Innocent bystanders. (laughs) You're all just watching, watching as he coaches me right now with spirituality gone wild. And Walt, have you ever felt this way with LOA today? Has anybody ever out there that's creating ever felt like that? Oh, sure. (laughs) How many days of the week do you have in mind? (laughs) so the first thing we're going to do with those days of the week is we're going to do uh we're going to do an inspired action Mm. well let's actually we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here let's take it back one step okay Okay. no no it's valid it's valid your question is a great question but i want to take it back one step uh because i i think this is probably true for a number of listeners i know it's going to be true for the broader population there are Many people, I'll say within law of attraction slash conscious creation circles who Mm -hmm. want to have abundance and who have thought about trying to do some kind of a business thing, but they were kind of intimidated about it, or they just didn't think they had the skills to do it, or they didn't have the background, um, or they didn't have the time, or they didn't have the money. And There's a long list of things that they didn't have. And so they just kind of hang back. It isn't so much that they aren't willing to take the inspired action. It's just that they're kind of afraid of it. There's something that's, they've got a block to use the popular term. They've got a block in the way and they don't really feel confident to take, to take that first step. But Andrew, when you sat down to write the book, you, you hadn't done that before. You were kind of taking an initial step that you had never done in the face of an unknown that you had no idea. It, it could just completely fall apart. You had all the possible fears in front of you, but you chose to go ahead. How did you do that? Well, first of all, in fairness, I had done it before, but it's actually worse that way because I'd done it before in the sense I'd written books that hadn't done anything. And you won't find them anywhere because I I authored them synonymously, you know, in in different names and just trying different things. So it wasn't even that I didn't have even just the, 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 uh, the grand um, blank page, the uncertainty. I'd actually failed already. So I already had the vibration of failure that I was carrying with. And the thing about it is <clears throat> through all that, I, I was inspired. I was, I was very heavily driven where it, it's kind of hard to articulate, but I, there was a level of uncertainty of, of how well the book would do. But what I did not have a level of uncertainty about was the value that I was giving in the book. And that I believe is what fueled it so well, because I came up with the title very early, which is a very thing about this. This is a bold, brash title and actually a very poor business decision if you can't back it up. If you can <laughs> back it up, it's a brilliant decision because people will buy it and they'll, they'll review it well, which fortunately they did. But if it's a horrible book with that title, I'll tell you this, the title will get people to buy. People will buy it and they will read it or they will start to read it. But if I gave them something that wasn't legitimate or lived up to it, the reviews would kill it and then it would vanish. So I was very like... I wasn't arrogant, but I was certainly bold in this, but it wasn't just a promise in the title to the reader. It was a challenge to myself. And it was an intention where I gave myself permission to do this because when I chose to go in this direction, go into the, I mean, this is the first law of attraction book I've ever written. And when I chose to make this decision, it was with the understanding that it's not even just there's hundreds of books out there. There's like over a thousand, literally law of attraction books on Amazon, in eBooks, all over the place. So it's a very crowded space and it, it kind of lends itself to, you know, to saying, if I'm going to write something, I need to be able to add something new to the conversation. Because if I'm not adding something new that's actually valuable, or at least I don't believe I am, what is the point? So I, I, I basically, well, without worrying about the sales, I mean, obviously I was taking my own medicine and I was visualizing, I was having gratitude. I was doing all my methods in service to the vision that the book is going to do on have impact. That part notwithstanding, I didn't really worry about how many books it would sell. I was more focused on just making it a great book, knowing that the title was really great title, knowing that the cover was going to draw eyeballs. So if I could only make the book something that really shifted a paradigm and really changed things, all those other pieces would take care of themselves enough to give me enough space to then kind of fuel the fire, meaning do things, do interviews, go on podcasts, do my YouTube channel, like continually do things but do things where there's already a, a leveraging point where there's already momentum. It was, it was in trying to serve the reader and trying to serve the customer and trying to serve the audience 
And having confidence in that and a conviction in that, that fueled me in everything else. And I believe people can take a lot of that into whatever business, whatever product, whatever service. If they can make something that looks really good and then actually is really good, they're doing a lot that's going to pave the way for a lot of future successes because that's where the stuff that you can't scale on your own scales, where there's positive word of mouth where people are talking about your book, they're recommending your book, they're talking about you, they're recommending you. Those things happen on their own when you're coming from a place of genuine service and hopefully you're choosing something, a product or service that you can actually deliver on. That's good, I love that. And and you may mention a few times of the word bold. You you said you you did something bold and I wanna really hone in on that one because uh, boldness, that in and of itself, that can be intimidating. I mean, that, that you're putting yourself out on the lot on a limb there and you're, and you're exposing yourself to the world in a sense. I mean, you could easily have decided, Oh, I can't do that. That's just too yeah. much, but you got yourself. How'd you get yourself to do that? So <laughs> I'd already failed. So I, I was at a point of being like, for me, there, there was, there wasn't going to be shame and failure. I, I didn't actually care about looking bad to friends or family. Because I'd already right. failed before and never worked done it. <laughs> like really. So I guess the real question is with that in mind is like, well, how did I take those steps and fail to begin with? Mm-hmm. And um, I, for me, I think it came out of the, the pain of past failures where it's like, listen, I've, I've, I've got to do something. I've got to, I've got to take action. And, and you brought something up before where, you know, there's people that they don't even take the inspired action to just hang back. Now I have a belief about this and I'm hopefully going to articulate it really well. And let me just say that if I successfully articulate this really well, it's because I am intimately familiar with it because I've been a guilty offender myself until I finally said, okay, I'm self-aware. Let me shift this. I think sometimes people don't take that action just the way sometimes people don't go all in with the law of attraction because there's that lingering fear of if this doesn't work, but I actually tried it, now there's no hope. If I hang back and I don't write that book, and I don't lean in all in with law of attraction and I don't start that, that fitness regime or like whatever it is. If I don't actually do it, I can always tell myself that I can do it. I can, I can rest on the, the possibility that there really is hope and something can happen. Whereas what about that fear of if I do it and then I fail? It's like, Oh, okay. Well, now other questions pop up is law of attraction works for everyone else. Is there something wrong with me? Did mm. I do it wrong? Am I unworthy as I had suspected for decades? Like these are all the things. So a key to all this is in your self-awareness of if you're not doing this thing, at least acknowledge it's because you're not scared of failure. You're scared of what the failure means. You're scared that the failure might mean, okay, well, if you're 20 and you live a long life, well, you've got another 70 years of being a failure with no hope. If you're 60, you've got another 30 years of no hope. If you're 90, you've got a, a, you're, you're the, the final leg. It's like no hope for the, like, what's the point? There's a fail. The fear really is in there being no hope. And if people could only see that there are limitless possibilities and that even if there is a failure, it's not the end, that there really is always something there. That should hopefully be enough where people will then say, "Okay, what can I do that's going to be in service to others? Because strategically, not only do I feel better about myself and not only do I feel more worthy, but that's the kind of thing that really works and helps me in terms of growing a successful business or being successful in a career or a job or whatever it might be. What you're talking about reminds me very much of a Will Smith quote, Will Smith, the actor. He said, fail early, fail often, and fail forward. Yeah. I Especially like the last forward. part, fail forward. I just, oh, I love that. And I, I love all of it because there's never really any failures. The failure is only in our judgment of the thing and the outcome that happened because we had an attachment to it. Yeah. You know, and what I love about what you're saying is take take the uh, pressure off here. There are limitless possibilities. If the thing that you tried isn't working the way that you've tried it. And I've done this. I have it right now. My whole system with spirituality gone wild. Andrew is set up on the back end to perform and do this, that and the other. Right. And I had it all in my head and I saw it all and it's not doing what I thought it should do. And is it then a failure? No, it probably needs some tweaking and shifting and it's time for a shift. 
And it's time to get more creative. Cool, man. I created that. I can go, I can level up. So one of the biggest things I heard you say is raise your damn standards. Mm. Yeah. Raise your standards for yourself, for yourself. Raise your standards. And, and also don't, don't put other people that seem like successes on a pedestal as if they're different from you. So like, for example, again, drop the mic. Um, so, so social media. Um, I, I don't complain on social media because I don't want to put that energy out there. But also by virtue of the fact that I don't complain, it's very easy to look at me like, Oh, here's my new sales numbers and here's this and here's that. Andrew's life's perfect. Well, no. In fact, even in the process of marketing the book, I failed many times. It's just people don't see those failures because yeah, like 85,000 books by the end of this year. Who's to say that if I did everything the right way, I wouldn't have 400,000 copies sold by now. Maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't, but I, I can look back on things where I tried things and I failed. I'm like, okay, well, that didn't work, but I'm just going to keep going. I'm not going to get down on myself. And at the time, the decisions seemed like, you know, it seemed like a sensible thing to do. It's certainly a sensible thing to try. Why not do it? I mean, it's again, I, I can fill a book with the mistakes I've made. But in addition to doing that, because I would made so many mistakes before I ever published a book on other book attempts, I already had a lot of good strategies and a lot of smart decisions that I automatically made in the moment. I already understood, you know, like one thing and, and Amazon doesn't have this functionality anymore. And, and here's the, the ironic thing. They discontinued the functionality because it was not being used enough, which, which blows my mind. So the functionality that they had is when someone left a review, you can comment and you can reply to yes. which you say, okay, well, let's say you're an up and coming author and someone leaves a five star review. Why wouldn't you go in and reply to them personally? Right. Why wouldn't you say their name? Why wouldn't you cite a specific comment they had in their review? I'm not talking about a copy and paste. I'm talking about reading it, having consideration and honoring that person, the time and energy they put in, which again, sends a really powerful message to them. It sends a very powerful message to anyone else that's looking at the reviews and might be thinking about leaving a review. And to me, I'm like, yeah. how is this underutilized with all the independent authors that are trying to get their book out there? They all get, they'll get two or three reviews. Why did that not reply to those two or three reviews? Because you know, they saw the reviews. You know, they went online. They, they checked Amazon. They kept refreshing, which by the way, screwed up the algorithm. Mistake. You keep screwing up the algorithm because you kept loading up the page without buying the book, which is telling Amazon that people aren't interested. So they're going to show it less. Nice little mistake there, right? <laughs> Very good but you point. keep refreshing yeah. and you're, you're waiting, you're waiting for the five star review and it comes in. And what, what do you do? You're like, yeah, honey, get over here. Check this out. Check this out. Is that awesome? And then you get up and you walk away instead of replying to it. And now you can't because the functionality is not there. So that's a mm. perfect example of if, if you're, if you have the mindset of having gratitude for your customer, having gratitude for your reader, you're going to do things like that. And I gave you an example of something that's no longer possible, but I gave that example because it's so clear and it demonstrates the attitude because that attitude bleeds into things that I still can do. When someone emails me, Hey, Andrew, I know you're a big deal. You sold 8,000 copies. You're probably not replying to you. You probably won't see this. Your staff member seeing this. But if you ever see this, blah, 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 and then they get a reply from me, they're like, okay, because I care enough to reply. It's not, I, I don't want to look like I care enough to reply. I actually care enough to reply. That's why I chose to write this book. That's why I chose to go down this road. I could have written other books. I know a lot of, I like, to, I mean, I could be wrong, but I like to think that I know a lot of things about a lot of other things. But those other things don't interest me in the sense that I'm going to be excited about engaging with readers, excited about talking about the content. That's another thing. Excited, excitement, inspired action, excitement. Isn't it funny how those kind of fit together? The thing about that, that thing that you're scared to do, well, you want to ask yourself, is part of that fear excitement that's misidentified? That's another question to ask yourself. But even so, there's a, at least some of it in there. But but when you finally take the plunge, there, sh there should be excitement. There should be enthusiasm. There should be like, oh, my, I I'm into this. I'm ready for this. And all those things, I mean, this, this to me is what bleeds into the action that leads to results, even if the action you're taking right now doesn't lead to the results that you're expecting. Because the investment you make in – the investment I made in all those other books is the, the seeds and the flowers are blooming right now with this one. But I, I started succeeding with this book with the very first word that I wrote on the very first book years ago, years ago, because it's all an investment. It's a vibrational investment. It's a consciousness investment. It's a blood, sweat and tears investment. It's a love investment. It's all those things. And it all manifests. And you put something in certain, certain ways, 
something else will come back in a completely different way that you weren't even expecting. But that's the beauty. Since you can't anticipate it, just be present and be intentional every single day and then invite it to happen for you. Oh, I love this. I love it. I love especially how you took failing because you talked about how you failed many times. And in the course of a beautiful monologue, you turned it into success during the monologue, during the presentation. I love that. That's fabulous. And in fact, uh, when you were talking about the failing part, it reminded me of a Bill Gates quote. And I don't remember the exact quote, so I'm going to have to paraphrase it. But the gist of it is everybody loves success. It's so easy and so much fun to, to have success, but you don't learn anything from it. The only thing you ever learn from is failure. And I got the sense that's exactly what you were talking about. All yeah. the stuff that you learned each time that you failed. And, and all those overnight successes, they only look like overnight successes. People, mm. the, 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 if you call 10 years an overnight success, I guess your people are, are an overnight success, right? In my case, 20 years. And, and by the way, it wasn't 20 years of failure. I, I also don't want to make it like this false impression like I failed for 20 years. No, I had ups and downs. I had, I had wins and losses. I learned across the way. I had, I had massive victories in the middle of it all, but I also made mistakes because I was willing to experiment and willing to try. I think people believe that they have this impression that success and or failure are both linear and that it's, it's almost like a straight line. Like life is not linear. Life is not a straight line. It only seems like that. We have a a sense of, of temporal movement as if it, you know, but it, it doesn't really always work that way. We just don't have the senses in our physical bodies to perceive what's really going on all the time. Wow. Oof. Love that. Absolutely love that. I, okay. I'm loving it. Can I, can I jump in? I, I jump have in. To. Yeah, go ahead. Well, because there's a couple other things that you were talking about that I want you to, uh, to expand on. And Walt brought up one word. It was bold. The other word is courageous. And you said, I don't want to come across arrogant. And there was something really important there. And the reason why is because confidence and arrogance are definitely not one and the same. Mm -hmm. What happens is, is that society has been geared to think that confidence is arrogance. However, I'd like to beg to differ because it's not. My confidence that I have today is the knowingness that just is, period. I don't waver from it. It just is. I speak my truth. And if speaking our truth is arrogant, well, then call it what the hell it is. I don't care. <laughs> call it what it is. Fact of the matter is, is that without bold, being bold and confident, you can't, stepping forward into an inspired action would be really tough. So I am really curious. How have you became bold and confident mm, besides well, be- Besides the contrast of not success. Well, first of all, thank you for the compliment, Debbie. I mean, so here's the thing. We're all worthy the instant we're born or even before that. We're all worthy. So there's obviously a difference between worthy and confidence. But And the reason I say this is because you don't have to earn your worthiness. But for me, at least in my specific situation, my confidence is earned. I earned it through trial and, and error. I learned it through success and through failure. I learned it in the sense that, you know, I learned about law of attraction in 2004. I spent four years fiddling about, experimenting, trying, failing, trying to, trying to work it all out. And then I hit a massive wall in 2008 that forced me to just say, all right, enough. No more, no more messing around. I'm just going all in every single day, five minutes, five or 10 minutes of gratitude visualization. Whereas those four years leading up, I would start, I would actually get results and I would still stop because isn't that funny how human nature is. So for me, the confidence comes from the experience. The reason I can talk about the law of attraction specifically is because I can articulate it really well, I believe. And the reason I can articulate it really well is a combination of being someone that just has written a lot and writes a lot for his whole life and also has experiences and has an insight into himself. Because my theory is the more um, personal something is the more universal it is. Meaning me, all the stuff that I talk about here, all the, 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 the hurdles that we jump, this is me articulating the hurdles I identified in myself and how I jumped them for myself. And the only time that realization came is after I had the worst week of my life in 2008, where I lost my company and my girlfriend all in the same week. And I had to say, all right, I don't care anymore. I don't care what happens when it happens, what happens. I'm just going to do these methods. And this time, if success comes, I'm going to keep doing it anyway. This time, if I fail, I'm going to keep doing it anyway. I'm going to keep doing it. It's only five minutes. I've strategically designed it. So it's just five minutes. So I can't even talk myself out of it. I am doing it. And as soon as I made that decision, that's when things happened. And that's the thing. It's like, it isn't a book that showed me. 
it isn't a video or another person, although these are all useful. I would hope they're all useful, but it was my life experience. It's when you achieve that life experience, you get something experientially, that's when the confidence really comes. And that's why, like, even my book by does, my book is designed to really get you out of your own way long enough to get the life experience because that's the real teacher. The book is just a way to just get you just, just enough that you get that experience because that's the way it's going to work. That's the way it worked for me. And that's the experience and result that I want to achieve for my readers. That's the hope. That's the, the goal. So confidence comes from the fact that I pushed hard enough and I went through enough to have enough of a deep insight for myself that I just understand where the different roads lead, the road of sticking with something, the road of deviating, the road of hope, the road of despair. I understand where they all lead in my own life. Therefore, I have enough confidence to articulate it in a certain context, in this case, law of attraction. Oh, I love this. I, I love the way that you uh, delved in, Debbie, uh, I had him delve into the courageous concept because it's it's similar to but different from the boldness. And both of them have a very similar antonym to them. They both are kind of the opposite of timidity. And I wanted to, to have you just talk about timidity for a minute, Andrew, because I think we are timid, particularly when we're thinking about doing something that we are going to take authorship of, not just a yeah. book, but we take authorship of anything in our lives. Timidity can, can almost be our, our enemy in a sense. And how do we overcome the timidity? So, so here's how I'll address this. It's very interesting because there were um, portions on in those early years where, again, I, I was not doing too well, but I was very much accepted by my friends and the, my way of being, I, I fit in, right? And there's certain things or certain, like, this stuff, everyone watching this gets it, but law of attraction is a little out there to other people. It's a little airy fairy. It's a little, oh, wait, I had one person who thought I was in a cult. I'm like, okay, thanks. <laughs> it got to a point where I was so frustrated with failure and so frustrated with whatever I was doing to keep the status quo that I would start asking myself, like, you know, okay, I'm thinking of this person who's going to judge me and that person that's going to laugh at Pete and that person that's going to look down on me. And then I had to ask myself, is this person ever going to pay my bills? Is this person going to sell tens of thousands of copies of book for me? Is this person going to go on podcasts for me? Is this person going to go through all the hardship that I've gone through for me? No, then I don't owe them that. And if, if, if it means sacrificing that friendship or that relationship, that's fine because I can't be holding on to a relationship that's going to keep me from being my best self. So I've personally gotten out of being timid. Here's where it gets funny. Like, cause if you watch some of my YouTube videos, especially the early ones where I'm experimenting with the tone and I'm using a little cheesy humor. Um, really like even now, sometimes I'll even cringe at it, but I don't care because it is what it is. But there were times where I was recording something or writing something or making a decision. And there's one person even specifically who came into mind like, Oh, this person would so look down on me for this. And once that happened, I'm like, okay, now I'm going to amp up the volume by 10. It wasn't even like, I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to spitefully get even sillier even more ridiculous, <laughs> even more out there. And obviously it's with the caveat that nothing that I'm doing is intentionally hurting anybody else. Cause obviously mm. you don't want to be extreme by like, let me do something that's reckless. I'm not going to speed in speed on uh, the wrong way down a highway because someone would judge me. That's, that's stupid. Right. But just in terms of doing something that no one else could come to harm, the only person that can come to harm is me by being embarrassed. It's like, no, the, those people are not paying my bills. Those people are not there for my success. So they're either with, the only valuable relationships for me are the people that are going to want me when I'm successful, the people that are going to be my friends then. Wonderful way to right. look at it. And once you're doing that, you're just not going to be timid because you want to think of those people that would judge you, but the people that, that want to keep you stuck in a place where you're not happy and fulfilled and say, all right, that does it. Now I'm really ramping it up. That's <laughs> how, I mean, now it's more an autopilot, but that's how I kind of got myself used to it and conditioned to automatically not be timid anymore. Yeah. No, that's like, I, I call that the rebel. We're sort of the rebel. I'm the yeah. rebel. Oh, they don't like it? Oh, watch this. It's about to get even <laughs> freaking hot. No. Yeah. And, and very well, much, by the way, Debbie, in conflict with my natural personality. I'm, I'm a people yeah, pleaser by true. nature. So I'm very much in conflict with it. I love that you're talking about that. Um, I, I too have been in, in that space and the people pleasing is a, is I'm a recovering people pleaser and I fully get it. I 100% recovering codependent. Fully get it. One of the things that I'm hearing that's been said that there's an overtone of is the word acceptance into everything that you've been talking about. So so now work that word into the things that you've just talked about. 
at, and then we can maybe go to a, to the appreciation factor. Yeah, for sure. Well, the funny thing about acceptance or really self-acceptance, because that's what it really comes down to, right? Self-acceptance. Totally. But it's such a yeah. cliche. And that's the problem. Here's the problem with cliches. Cliches are said often because mostly they're true. Otherwise, why wouldn't they be said, right? But because they are said so often, and they are often said as a way of making a point to someone that's already been going in the opposite direction of whatever that is, it bounces off somebody. It's no longer experiential. It's intellectual. And it doesn't really resonate. It doesn't really hit them. Meaning for me to be like, just accept yourself. Well, yeah, there's a truth there. But, but by, that, by the same token, people have heard that so many times. It just bounces off of them because then they've tried to do it. And then something's gone wrong. And now it's like it's almost like. It's, it almost makes it feel even more distant from them, right? So to me, the trick is how do we achieve self-acceptance without that term and without the concepts and the distortions and the friction that we've assigned to that term? How do we, how do we achieve it without letting those things prevent us from achieving it? And this actually lends itself into gratitude because when you make a decision to feel gratitude yeah. for yourself, for your life, for the people that really care about you, the people that you really care about, when you do that, it builds automatically for you a self-esteem, right. a confidence, a level of integrity, a level of comfort, a level of knowing and consciousness and awareness within yourself that bleeds over into those things. You, in my opinion, you achieve self-acceptance, you achieve confidence, you achieve momentum, you achieve the ability, you achieve the transcending timidity, right? Or uh, you, you achieve all those things. By leaning into gratitude because it's a natural positive emotion that shines so brightly, it erases the shadow of all of those other things that was holding you back. I gotta agree with it on point, a hundred percent. Yeah, I Period. think so too. Yeah, there's yeah, no other see... thing. Oh, go ahead. There's just there is there's nothing else in my life that has worked like the law of appreciation, gratitude specifically grateful beingness and there's such a difference between oh i'm 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 grateful for you or i'm grateful for this the the house that i have and i am as a matter of fact when i was driving back from the store i was thinking about how much i really love i love my life i love my life right now and how much i appreciate my life and and all of that but grateful beingness is a state of being for me and i'd like for you to expand on gratitude and what that that really what are the what's the difference between being in gratitude and grateful beingness mm. well it's interesting because i'm having an interpretation of that but but one sounds to me where you're taking a conscious um focus or action toward it whereas the other one is just it's it's, it's naturally occurring for you without you focusing on it not that they're they're mutually ex- exclusive um, but, but for me, I think when you lean in the direction and try to focus on gratitude and, and do it authentically, like pick things that you could actually be excited about, that helps you condition yourself and make you more predisposed towards being that automatic person that just is in the state of gratitude and state of appreciation on autopilot. And it doesn't mean that you stop focusing. I mean, in my opinion, you focus every day, if even for just five minutes. But it just means that the more you do that, the more you have those those five minute sessions every day focusing, the more momentum you carry through for the rest of your day where it's just natural and easier for you just to be in a sense of appreciation. And because I've been such a chatterbox already and been giving you long winded answers today um, to give you like a really cool example. Um, I, I'm going to be careful with the details because I don't even want to activate this too too distinctly, but I made um, a, a really large purchase today. And then I got an email that put into question, like, what I bought and all this stuff. It was just really annoying. It's like, oh, you know, there's something where, like, we're, I'm, we're, I'm, we're all better than this. You're better than this. I'm better than this. But I just got really, like, upset. I'm watching my language. I'm not sure where we can go on this. But I got really <laughs> upset. So in the middle of all that, um, a message comes through um, on Facebook. And it's a video. And the person says, we just want to thank you. And I click on the video and I'll be careful with the details because um, some of them were intimate details. But it was a reader of mine who who manifested the love of her life and manifested all these amazing changes. And she was thanking my book. She's like she'd read other books before. I feel like I'm 
give myself a review here, but this is what she said. She, she'd read other books before and, you know, she had such horrible situations. She wished she'd found mine sooner, but she found mine and she's, she's on cloud nine and her fiance, her now her fiance, they've got this really thriving business, like all these things. And it just, it, it erased that frustration that I was just experiencing. And the reason I'm bringing this up is this is what momentum is about. It's not about having a perfect life. It's about intentionally installing enough momentum where when something really annoys you, there's something waiting for you on the back end. There's good news or something that's going to fill you with more genuine appreciation and happiness because the timing of that video, it was just when I hung up with customer service, like literally like within 30 seconds. And I'm just like, I am, I'm hot. I'm steaming. And then that even that comes in and it changed, it put everything in perspective for me. These are the things that happen. Your, your life's not perfect, but, but, Whereas I could have in another time, in another day, really been just upset all day, which would have fueled a lot of negative energy and a lot of negative momentum, which would have bled over into the next day. Instead, boom, pattern interrupt because you've earned this, Andrew, because you vibrationally invested enough gratitude every single day that these things will come and stop you in your tracks before you do something bad, before you do something really stupid and really um, deconstruct, like, you know, destructive to, to your life and to your path. Oof, love I that. love how the universe, right? The universe just shows up. I actually had this happen this morning. I swear to God. In a different way, though, I wasn't really. It was more like when I question myself, the universe shows me up and gives me, oh, gives me some sort of confirmation. Why are you questioning yourself? Hmm. I have that moment. I have the momentum of reminders of you know better than this. Oh, yeah, that's right. I got a message from Kirk Nurmi. He said, Debbie G, who do you want to be today? Ooh. And I sat back and went, oh, you're so good, dude. Like, so good. <laughs> so good, universe. So good. And, and you know, went on to say, like, because he's going to come back in the new year to be to, for an interview. Let me tell you, Kirk's next level. Your next level. You know what I'm saying? And this is what I sat there and thought to myself was got to level up. You got to raise the bar, raise the standards. We love, I love to raise the bar because it's like, it's a game. It's like so much freaking fun, man. You know, and how do you raise the bar? Gratitude. It's the G vibe. It's that thing. It's that thing. And that grateful beingness, you're right. It is that state of being because you just are. But, dude, isn't it rad? And I love the way you're putting it, that you have this momentum out there so that when you need it, it shows up for you. I hope you all are catching this. Please type into the chat. I want to know what you are, what your takeaways are. And also, we're going to put the link to the book into the chat momentarily. I'll be right there with it. Andrew, you're sparking my G vibe, man. Like, <laughs> totally. That's true. By the way, that's your gratitude vibration. If anybody's thinking anything funny, ha ha, silly. Mm. Seriously, this is some cool, sh cool shit, man. Walt, thank you. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Uh, something else that you mentioned too, Andrew, that I wanted to point to. You talked about how um, previously in your circle of friends, you you kind of did some pruning. You said some of these friends aren't really serving me the way I need them to, so I'm going to. I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to shift who I'm spending my time with, giving my attention with. And I wanted to hone in on that because the positive psychologist, Sean Aker, makes the point that social connectedness is the number one predictor, number one predictor of one's success in life, ahead mm. of everything else, ahead of whatever degrees you have, what you've studied, whether you go into business, what you do for a living, you know, how well you did uh, in building the business, um, what, how well you've done with your relation. I mean, it is the number one predictor. And it's, it's literally predictive 75 or 70 percent of the time. And to give you a contrast of uh, to, to kind of give it a context, the the relationship between smoking and getting cancer if you smoke cigarettes continuously, you have a 45% chance of getting cancer. You have a 70% chance of being successful if you have the right circle of friends around you. Mm. So I really wanted to hone in on just how valuable that – that was a big, important shift you made. How did you do that? What? How did you decide, wow, I got to do this? You know, I, 
I wish I could put words to it other than I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. It, it got mm-hmm. to like, I mean, I got to a point where I had a recognition. I basically was able to look back on enough years and the situation where like to understand that, okay, if I'm doing this, then I have this to look forward to. And I, I just made a choice. I chose something different. And it's interesting because, you know, I, I couldn't agree more about, you know, the, the people you surround yourself with. It's even more the dynamic than, than many people realize though, because for me, it's not just about surrounding yourself with successful people. It's about surrounding yourself with successful people that want you to succeed. And what I mean by that is sometimes you can surround yourself with successful people that have the a whole codependent where they want someone less than them. They want someone held down. So part of it's where they're, they're, they'll either even subconsciously or with subtlety, they'll, they'll hold their success over the other person's head as in this is mine and never, and can never be yours. So it really becomes a piece of it's, it's not, I mean, and I'm not saying you didn't say this, but just for people that might be misinterpreting, it's not just about success in its, in and of itself, but it's the attitude that's backed through the success because some people are successful and miserable, whereas other people are successful and thriving. And I, I would encourage people if you could do it in person, fine, but until you can find the right people in person, even though that is priceless, that's the beauty of going online. That's the beauty of, of watching interviews. That's the beauty of watching videos and, and listening to, you know, to audios or whatever it might be. Even though it's not in person, you are finding ways of surrounding yourself with that energy, with that consciousness, with that intention. And that's going to carry you a certain along the way until there'll come a point, obviously, because you will be so high up where you'll naturally be meeting people in person as well that will do that for you. Wow. Very, very well said. That's, I love that. That's the truth. Period. That's what, it's what shows, it's what shows up in my life over and over again. Yeah. Apparently and, Alexa, it's Alexa's truth too, cause she just decided <laughs> to talk. I just, can you all hear Alexa? Okay. So apparently she's like, Alexa, please be quiet. Okay. So yeah, and I, I gotta like, say, and oh. this isn't blowing smoke. People watching you both at, on a regular routine, that's one version of doing this. That's a vert. Like, if anyone's wondering, like, oh my God, how do I do this? Guess what? If you're watching this, you're doing it. You, the fact that you watch Walt and Debbie means that you are already engaging in this process. And if you feel like you don't have your results yet, well, then that just means it's a different tweak. This is one thing that you're doing correct. Another thing that you might be doing incorrectly, for example, might be focusing on law of attraction methods with the in- expressed intent of forcing a result, which again, you're inadvertently putting out the idea and the focus of not having it. Where instead, if you just focus on gratitude and focus on these law of attraction methods for the sake of enjoying them in the moment, that's going to make a shift for you. That's going to make something different because now you have an energy of enthusiasm, gratitude, ease, and now the universe hears that versus the energy of you gritting your teeth trying to force it into your world. Yeah, I agree with that. In fact, I'll take that a step further. You never know exactly when the thing you're looking for is going to show up. So Mm. just keep doing the stuff that you would do anyway. Don't worry about yeah. when it's going to show up because you, you can't predict it in advance. All you can do gift. is just keeping the steps. Take, take all the steps wall. you know how to take. Yeah, it, it's a I gift ca- that you I don't ca- know when because when you don't know when, it can come at any time, meaning now you're open to new possibilities. And I can right. say from personal experience that when I was able to let go of time on a, on a number of things, they came faster. Mm-hmm. And other things that I let go of time on, they haven't come yet, but I'm still along a good path. Like I want to sell a million copies of the book. I'm not there right now, but I have a level of ease about it. I'm not stressing it. And I think that is part of why I'll hopefully get to a hundred thousand soon because I'm not stressing it. Oh, I don't have any doubt. You're getting to a hundred thousand. I mean, totally. you're too close. If you didn't, I'd be in shock, probably taken to the hospital. So yes, you're going to get to a hundred. I know that's going to happen. <laughs> well, I, you know, and everybody, I posted the the link to go purchase the book into the chat. And then also a really great quote from the book, which is feeling good about anything puts you in the receiving mode for everything you want. As long as you don't then slow it down by thinking contradicting thoughts about the thing that you want, which I thought was great. Exactly. Don't rush it. The other thing is that I've been hearing is an overtone of what I call the sacred yes which is what Walt is doing. It's what I'm doing. It's what you're doing, Andrew. It's that sacred yes. It's the call from the universe to show up and share. That's it. With no expectation, you're doing it because you're giving something to somebody that that, that's going to help them. 
you're being of service first and foremost before you're doing anything else, you're being of service. And anybody that's had that sacred yes out there knows that being of service is what this is truly about. The af- the effects of this are what Andrew is, is reaping right now. Yeah. Yep, that's true. And, and the other thing, too, is when you're doing that service, it feels good. That's what yeah. keeps you going, right? Because every time you, you, you do something that helps somebody else, oh, God, I can't tell you how many times lately I've been getting feedback and input from people who say they've been listening to the show and I've been able to do stuff with them. And I didn't even know I was doing stuff with them. I mean, it's fabulous. That's what keeps me going. Like, oh, wow. All yeah. this stuff happening in the background I didn't even know was there. It's wonderful. I, I've said this yeah. often, and I wouldn't be surprised if I've said this um, on this show already, but it's it's almost like a simultaneous selfless and selfish thing. I am selfishly being selfless because I know when I do that, I feel good, but it's okay because through that selfish act of trying to do it, I'm, everyone's winning. Everyone's benefiting. So it's, I would, I would, I would advise people selfishly be selfless or selfishly serve because you will feel legitimately good. You'll know that you're a value and that will enhance your sense of worth. Now you don't need that, that to be worthy, but it's a wonderful life hack for feeling worthy. And when you feel worthy, you more easily access your worthiness. So it's a wonderful method. It's a wonderful tactic or strategy by which you can do more for yourself. And by the way, that doesn't mean that you have to um, host a podcast or write a book or anything like that. One thing that inspired me so long ago, because this could be something that you could do on a regular basis or something that you randomly do once. I'll never forget. I was on um, news boards back when there was like news boards with the Internet. And <laughs> it was it was a um a board dedicated to a band and some stranger that, that no one really knew. Um, they were talking about like how depressed they were and they were thinking about like taking their own life. And my friend, Chris, again, didn't know this person immediately responded. And this is like back in the internet days where it's really weird to connect with a stranger who knows who they are type of deal. He was like, Hey dude, are you okay? Like, do you want to talk? Can I do something for you? And he meant that earnestly. And I hadn't done that. And and when I saw him do it, on the one hand, I felt a little bad about myself. Like, oh, I, I, I want to be the type of person that will do that. But by that same token, I'm like, well, no, this is a this is a teaching moment. I can be inspired and really learn from that. I could really take that as a really solid example of the type of person I want to be, whether or not that exact opportunity ever presents itself ever again. It's more about just taking the lesson and taking the cue. And, and taking the inspiration that, that someone else did that and, and just being willing to learn from that. By the way, the opportunities do keep coming. Yeah, they do. I've got to tell you that the value for service, that's one of the reasons I married Joe. There were a couple of reasons, but the, his value for service met my value for service out in the world. And I watched for it. Believe me, I'm watching. And he's watching me too. It wasn't, it, it, you know, <laughs> it, that, that, that value for service is huge. If you know that that's part of your, that's just, that's just all there is to it. When you're out in public, I want to see how you treat other people. You better, it, and, and, and it better be showing up the way I show up or you're not going to be around because that just isn't going to fly with me. Period. You know, and I love what you said. Selfish to be selfless. Totally. Absolutely, it is. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, Andrew yeah. is definitely the man who knows how to turn a phrase. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> Seriously, man, I, I love it. Compassion is contagious. Thank you, Jeffrey. Look at that. Yeah, there we go. That's awesome. cool. I like that one, Jeffrey. I love compassion and empathy, and that's what being of service to other people. This is, I mean, come on, we are in the holidays right now, y'all. Mm. I have my. My little Santa outfits are up above me. They haven't decorated much yet. <laughs> They're pretty cute, though. Come on. Yeah. You know, but we are at this time of year where we are reminded. You have actually, y'all don't have, we have no excuses right now. We are being reminded just for the sheer type of year, the time of year it is, that it is time to step up and be a service and be giving. To be giving. What are you giving? I don't know about y'all, but I love to shop. And I love shopping for other people. And I, my son, Justin's the hardest one to shop for. Wait till <laughs> you, I'll, I will show everybody what he's getting. And you're going to be seeing an interview from the person who created it. Ooh. I nice. Tell you. <laughs> Uh-oh, the secret's out. 
<laughs> well, he doesn't, you know, like, he doesn't watch me anyway. It's all right. He is 33 and my son. It, they're not going to watch their mother online. <laughs> I won't. But the, the, the whole, now I'm using my son. This is a gift. This is fun. But what about the people out there that uh, are not looking at that? The ones that we can show up for that are like, I don't even know how we're going to have food this week, you know, much less if you're into trees, get a tree or any of that. There's so many people out there who could who could really benefit from all of us showing up and being a service. So. Um, and a lot of ways to do know, it. Let's be honest. I mean, you, you, you don't even have to be giving any physical God. things. You can give the gift of kindness, mm-hmm. give the gift of love, yeah. the, the gift of, a, of, a, of a sympathetic ear. There are lots of ways you can give. People yeah. assume that it has to be money, but it doesn't yeah. have to be money. Our time is the most valuable commodity that we have. Period. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. So. I remember back when my, my son was in, in elementary school, both my kids were, uh, they were like fourth grade and sixth grade. And I created a group called Circle of Friends and I went to the school board and got it approved. And this is where I took 25 kids every Friday to a local convalescent home. And they, I have great pictures from this where they colored with people. They, they had the time of their life learning to give their time and the whole idea and concept behind this was for them to learn to give their time that was what what our discussions were on the walk to the convalescent there and then on the way back they would be telling me what it felt like I remember a couple of years later one of these kids came to me and they, they were like at eighth eighth grade now or something and they're like you that changed my life I think about those kids today. Can you even, I'm, I'm hoping somehow I'll find out how that impacted some of them. We mm-hmm. had the funnest, we had the funnest open house for PTA at the end of that year, you know, because we, we, we did a big collage and had it on board and stuff. It was great. But yeah, it costs zero to be kind and it costs zero to give your time. That's really good. Yeah. Hey, I, I need to get a couple of quick announcements in here, and then we'll go back to you, Andrew, for a wrap-up. Um, but we got a number of guests coming up next week, and I want to let people know about that, particularly those who like to listen to the live stream. First of all, on Monday, Selena Dorsey is going to be in the house talking about her experience with her businesses that she started up over the years and how she got started and what kinds of, uh, you know, thought processes she went through. And then on Tuesday, we got Luke Bertazza, who's part of the Tire community. He's now, I, I believe he's on his way to becoming a coach. He's a mentor there. That's going to be a big visit. Thursday, Donna Ferguson is going to be joining us. In fact, Neil's going to make oh, a, a special so trip cool. over to Thursday to join us on that one. And then Friday, we got Doug Vermeeren. Doug Vermeeren is an entrepreneur. He is the creator of the six minute workday. I mean, we are shock loaded with interviews that are going to be really great next week. So just want to give everybody a heads up about that stuff. But right now, I got to thank Andrew for taking the time, as he so generously does so often. Can't leave the show before you tell people about how to find the book, how to find Andrew Cap, how to find everything that needs to be found. Awesome. Well, first of all, well, thanks. Well, and Tabby, thank you as always for both being so welcoming and, you know, you, you always pull like me, you pull inspiration out of me where I like, I, I can't believe I'm saying this stuff. So thank you for that. Um, finding the book's pretty easy. If you go to lastlawofattractionbook.com, that'll forward to the Amazon listing. And it's, you know, Amazon Audible, it's, it's a paperback, it's a hardcover, it's Kindle, it's audiobook, any of those things. But if you don't want to pull out your wallet, that's cool also. You can very easily go to youtube.com slash Andrew Cap. That's K-A-P. And, um, I've got, over a hundred videos there and, and hopefully those will serve you whether you get the book or whether you watch YouTube uh, channel videos, either way, it's just my sincere intent that the content serves you in the way that is really going to get you to that next step. So thanks to everyone for watching. And again, Walt and Debbie, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And Debbie G, you. You, you get the last word today. You get to, to give us the, the send off. So what's the, the last thought to give to people as we close off for the day? Find somebody in your life you can say you're grateful for. Find somebody. Tell somebody you're grateful for them. It's not it's, the what's are great, but the who's are are so much better. I'm grateful for Foxy, and I'm grateful for both of you. 
Thank you so much. And and yes, here, say hi, Foxy. No, you don't want to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, wow, Andrew, you've just been you've been amazing as always. And I look forward to I look forward to uh, having you on Cup of Grata again, and also other future stuff. Are you going to say hi? Oh, she's my angel puppy. She said hi. <laughs> she's awesome. She very quietly too. Yeah. Well, yes. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Debbie G. Thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.